Hey folks, how is everybody doing? I tell you what, this is going to be a very, very fun night. Uh, we have a lot of good stuff in store for you. We being in my shop tonight is Matt Coppersmith. Matt, give us your uh, give us your entire life story in 17 seconds. 17 seconds. I'm Matt Coppersmith. I own Coppersmith Customs. Uh, you can find me at Coppersmith Customs pretty much anywhere that it's social media. I make stuff. I make custom furniture, decor, a lot of resin, wood. Metal. You do a lot of welding. Yep. So a little bit, uh, you got your hands on a lot of different stuff. So one of the things that's cool about having Matt here is because like me, he does a lot of different things, turning, flat work, <laughs> welding, chainsaw. Um, he's a good addition to, um, as we start talking about tools, doing some explaining and helping you understand what we're talking about, right? Yeah. I'm going to try, do my best. So what's so the deal? Know. Why are we here tonight? What, what kind of catalyzed this event? Well, the way I understand it, we got something going on. Some I think there's a thing. virus going yeah. around. So IWF in Atlanta got canceled. So we're here. We've got a few tools. So we're going to show you what, what, show you some stuff like what you would have seen at IWF. Yeah, this is, a, this is fun. In a case where normally um, about a couple months ago, I would have been in Atlanta at the show. We are bringing the show into my shop. And uh, we've got seven different products here. And we've been talking to the manufacturer. So we're going to, here's the format. Um, we're going to go from tool to tool and we're going to talk about just like they would at a show. We're going to talk about features and benefits of the tool and we're going to run it. We're going to do some cuts. We're going to make some stuff happen. We're going to make some noise and sawdust. So one of the things I'm going to qualify here is you are of course, welcome to answer or ask questions. We'll try to do the answering <laughs> part. Um, we are sticking to questions that are about these products. So you're probably familiar uh, second Thursday of every month, we do a general Q and a, that's where we can take those general questions. But here we're going to stick to questions that are specifically about the products that we're talking about tonight. And then the other thing I'll point out before we kick off is, um, when you're on WWGOA.com, there's a chat role where you're posting your questions right below that. There's a banner that allows you to sign up for our newsletter. The newsletter, if you click on that and sign up, this is where when we get a new video, when we get a new article, when someday I get Matt to write for us or whatever happens next, um, that's where those newsletters go out and they let you know what the new content is. So as you're watching tonight, take a second, go down there and sign up for the newsletter and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah. What do you think? Should we jump in? Yeah, I'm ready. Tool I'm, number I'm, yeah, one. I'm excited. All right. So we're starting with Woodmaster and and it's kind of my brain wants to call this a Woodmaster planer, but that would be doing it a disservice. Absolutely. Um, and what we've got a multifunction tool here, right? Right. Um, we're going to talk about the planer because that's a key point. However, what's cool with this is a lot of woodworkers monetize this machine by, in addition to planing, making molding, doing gang ripping, and that kind of stuff. So on the table here, let me get my junk out of the way. <laughs> We've got some of the stuff that goes with that aspect of the machine. So when we talk about um, the other things it's capable of doing, again, we'll come back to the planer head, but um, drum sander, and I believe you have a sander in your shop. I do. And uh, do you use it a little bit? Um, yeah. I, mean. <laughs> one of the, I think a sander is one of the best additions you can put in a shop because it's anything we can send through this and not have to then stand there with a random orbit sander. Right. Um, sanding, you know, the S word, I try to avoid whenever possible. I think so, mine ran for six hours straight yesterday. I, yeah. was, I was flattening a lot of stuff, so. So the, the addition of a drum sander to this tool is one thing we can do by swapping parts out. We can also then run a molding head in this, and it's just what it sounds like. When I run a stick of wood through there, I can turn it into molding, and I can do a couple things with that. We can put molding in our own house. We can sell that molding. Um, and preceding the molding step, very likely, have set it up with gang rip. So imagine in a second, you're going to see under the hood here, and there's a shaft in there on which I can position these cutters. So when they're in this position, I'm going to make a rip that is that wide, that wide, that wide. So we can use that to really, really easily feed the wood through and automatically cut it to those sizes and then put the molding head in. And and what I like about this too is, is that it's a small, it's a footprint and you have so many different things. A lot of capabilities yeah. in a small area. So yeah. like, especially if you have one of those small shops, if you're in a gra small garage, whatnot, you, 
you're getting a lot of capacity with just one machine. Well, yeah, and riddle me this, Batman. So we've got a we've got a planer, a sander, gang rip, and a molder. Right. So I've got a pretty good shot, pretty good size shot, but I wouldn't want to eat up the real estate to have each yeah. of those five as a standalone tool yeah. in there. So how many square feet is that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> let's, um, I'm really excited about the planer head. So let's take the, I'm going to unplug it first. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Look at that. <sighs> All right. All right. Take dust shroud or dust collection. We're going to disconnect. And what we want to do here is get this off because I am really excited about Oop. this planer head. So I, I love this feature that you put on here. Magnets <laughs> yeah. for your well, washers. Because I have dropped these on the floor more than once. All right. All right, we'll lift this off to the floor. I'm hung up here. There we go. All right, so here is what's cool. I'm going to spin this to the camera. This is a helical cutter head with carbide inserts. And Matt, we were just talking about what's going on here. So give the uh, you give the folks at home a little helical versus spiral here. <laughs> and, and, and mind I'm you, gonna... George just gave me this breakdown of the helical versus spi spiral. So we'll see what we can do. Um, you know, I don't even know if I can put it into your words. So the, the way well, you, the you start works, and if I need to, I'll, we'll pick it up. <laughs> the, see, now I'm blanking on what was the other word? Spiral. Spiral. So a spiral is basically going to be like a, a, you take it like a sheet of wood or a sheet of paper. It's going to be your knife and it's going to be a flat piece and it's just going to scrape away at the wood, right? It's, it's attacking the wood dead straight. It's dead straight. Just like a, so, yeah. so we could have carbide inserts like we have here in, in a, a straight spiral line. pattern. Yeah. yeah. But each of those cutters is basically perpendicular to the grain of the wood right. that you're feeding. Versus this, it's going to, it's going to be more of kind of shaving the wood like you would with, with a, with in like turning with a gouge. When you do or a shear yeah, instead a of shear, a scrape. Yeah. Or if you took, you think about when you were maybe learning to use a hand plane yeah. and they tell you instead of just attacking the wood straight on, give it a little skew angle. It just a little bit. And that's what happens here is on a true helix like we have here, each individual cutter is introducing that shear angle. And you're going to see in just a second the cut quality. Um, it really, really, really goes a long way toward improving the cut quality. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's that, yeah, like you said, the hand plane. That's a great, if you go out, if you go out something straight with that straight blade, it, you might kind of tear it or it might bounce a little bit. This is yep. going to cut through it nicer. So Yeah. So it's a, it's a really cool thing. And like I said, that I, I have run a lot of stuff through here and I continue to not being able to get over. I just can't get over the cut quality that comes out of this. Um, and we should mention there are a variety of sizes of machines available from Woodmaster. So if, if this size isn't right for you, you can go up, you can go down, you can pick the size and the footprint that works for your particular shop and the work you're going to do. The other thing I, I, I just noticed this too is the fact that they are the carbide cutters. Yep. So, and you know, you've got four sizes. You don't before you have to think about replacing. Your yeah. Blade. So it's cool. So one thing, you know, carbide we know is long lasting, mm -hmm. and then on top of that, each of these cutters has four sides. So yeah. one of the things that's cool about individual inserts like this, as opposed to a long planer knife is if I do inadvertently send something through and I chip one of these cutters, right. I could turn just that one cutter. Yeah. Where on a planer knife, I'm going to send that whole knife in to get sharpened, even though I only have a bad spot and maybe in the very middle of it. Yeah. So it gives me a lot more options. And then too, just over the life of the cutter head, um, being able to, when at some point they're going to be dull. Um, so I can turn them 90 degrees, fresh edge, and I can do that three times beyond where we are right, right now and have fresh edge, fresh edge, fresh edge, yeah. which each of those turns and very cleverly they're numbered. <laughs> so I can keep track of which is which. That's yeah. A very yeah. smart addition to the inserts. No, I love that. I, yeah. And that's that, that true helical head. You can see it just as it's coming through here. So yep. it's all right. Should we, uh, we have no questions on the Woodmaster yet. <laughs> 
Everyone wants to see it. I want to see it. I actually haven't even seen it run yet. Yeah. Like, so we're going to show you some toys and make it. chips. I'm ready. All right. Let me move yeah. my laptop so we don't have an industrial accident. Well, that sounds good. Pivot this guy back. <laughs> How about uh, let's go? Let's go like this. Yeah. And then if you roll the accessory table out, por favor. This is the live stream thing, right? Where you get to see all this the, uh, gobbledygook. Yeah. The behind the scenes. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's leave this a second. Okay. Oh yeah, that's right. We're still. Thank open. you. Sorry. And then we'll come up yeah. and over. Nice. That's twice and drop those. I like your band clamp. Okay. And we now. have for you. What I believe will be an absolutely beautiful piece of spalted maple. Um, and when we talk about these helical cutters, there are a couple things going here. So we're going to get a good surface finish. But this becomes especially important in woods that are prone to chipping. So anything that's got some figure to it, um, a bird's eye maple, a curly maple, um, Birch in general can be a wood that's difficult to plane just because it's prone to chipping. So these are all occasions where the helical cutter, in addition to, you know, it's going to give a good surface finish to any wood, but it's really a benefit when we get into that stuff that's prone to tearing up. Mm -hmm. Are you ready for power? I think we are. Where'd this cord go? Up right above your head. Oh, I forget, I forget about that stuff. Okay. All right. We in our happy place. Matt's going to get his ears on. Yeah. Can we be there? I think you're okay there. Okay. Yep. Now, we're going to challenge, uh, Nick is running camera tonight. We're going to challenge Nick a little bit. Here's one of the things that's so cool about when you get a good cut off a piece. Tell me what you need, Nick, because I can see curl in the maple. Mm -hmm. And um, it's something that it, if we can see this now, um, you can imagine when finish gets on right. this, the way this is going to pop. But are, we, are you getting a little bit of that, Nick, right? Especially right there. Yeah, there's a bunch right through here, too. Man. So, uh, I noticed that this, like, the speed. Now, this is, this is it's variable speed, right? You can mm -hmm. adjust the feed, Yep. how that works, too, right? Yeah, and that's important, especially because we're multifunction. So what we need for planing versus sanding versus molding versus gang rip. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. It's variable speed, and I didn't mess with that because we were just, yeah, because we're only planing. But, but it um, felt like it went through, I mean, it, set up, it was set up perfectly, like went through at a perfect pace. So. And the other thing, this is really subjective on my part, but I find that, I believe, 
the helical heads run quieter mm -hmm. than a straight knife cutter head would, which, you know, either way we're going to wear bearing right. protection, but um, there's just less of that, less icky noise going on in the right. shop. Let me look, like um, let me check the laptop again. All these worm lines and stuff too coming through here. Super cool. Yeah, I'm well, asking. so it's funny. Um, oh, we do have a couple couple things going on here. Uh, Cleston is asking cost of the Woodmaster. You know what? And off the top of my head, I don't know. Now, Katie's done a great job here of um, a little bit up in the chat roll. She's got Woodmaster's website, and that's where you can go to get information about the machine. So, um a little bit further down, somebody asks about size, and I know we can do this in a 21 inch, in a 25 inch, and I believe it's also available in a 12 inch. So again, you can match um, width of the head to the type of work that you typically do. Um, Butch says, is it a 220 machine? And yeah, 220 volt, yep. Um, Jim asked how much horsepower and is it three phase? This is not, this is a single phase machine and I'm having a little memory blank. I think it is, I think, I think it's a three seven, horse. Or no, no, I no, think no. it's a, I think we're running a seven horse on this. Yeah, I don't remember. Um, I don't, don't, uh, don't quote me on that because I'm having a brain bubble at the <laughs> second in time. Um, Bruce says, do the helical colors, helical cutters help at all with snipe? Mm. So that's not, the, the helical cutters are all about Really good surface finish, and as we've noticed, it runs quieter. Snipe is a function of the way you set up the machine. So um, good um, flat or in-line in-feed and out-feed tables, and then we can adjust the down pressure on the in-feed and out-feed rollers on this machine, and having that set right is what's going to help you stay away from snipe. And this is this is HGPE, I, I believe, right? The in-feed and out-feed? Yep. So, I mean, that's... Yep. Like yeah, and it's a continuous piece front to back, mm -hmm. so that helps it run good. And then Cleston, thanks for looking. Uh, he's doing a little research for us there. <laughs> Available in 12, 21, and 25-inch widths. Okay. Um, Michael asks, um, are shot vacuums effective, or do you recommend all-out dust collection? On something like this, the volume of chips we're producing a shot yeah. vacuum would not be able to keep up. We really want to have the uh, the high CFM flow that's coming off of a dust collector. Yeah, it was pulling big chips. So I mean, it's it's not dust collect, uh, dust back or shop back is just not going to have the the airflow to to move this. It's gonna if if you use it, it's probably just going to clog up right in the end and not suck it through. I'd say dust collection is going to be the way to go. Yeah, and airflow is a great way to state it. Um, yeah. that we we need to move that high volume of air. Okay, so we seem to have, um, and obviously you can keep asking questions, but I think we're ready to move on to our next product. And then, uh, Nick, do you need anything from us on, a, on the move here? Okay, Nick no. is shaking his head no. Okay. Okay, um, here's where we're going next. Easy Wood Tool is the next manufacturer that we're working with here. And um, you've been doing some turning, I know, in yeah. your shop. A lathe is a kind of a recent addition for you. Do you like it? you like turning bowls? I, yeah, we just, uh, my, we just started, picked up a lathe two months ago, I think now. I've been doing, I did pens and some handles. I had a little little mini lathe before that, but... Yeah, the bowls are a lot of fun. So actually, and I'll tell you, my, my wife has gotten into it. She is now a full-fledged member of the business. She is making bowls. We're going to be selling them soon. Nice. That's the whole, I, like, she's way better than me. So don't. <laughs> <laughs> so to be real specific with where we're going with this one, we are going to talk about four different lathe chisels. And the first three are all about hollowing, and we're going to do some of that here on this bowl. We'll talk more about that in a bit. So... With Easywood's line of hollowing chisels, these are now the largest in the line. So there are other 
chisels available. If you're doing smaller scale work, you can do use the smaller scale tools for that. So what we're going to do is go through a sequence of events here, which would be when we first start the hollowing process, you're going to start with this tool. Then we'll talk more about what that process looks like. We get to a point where we need to start to reach around the corner. And then we're going to come to this tool to begin that reach to start to wrap around. Then in order to get further reach, this one's got more of a hook to it. And that's going to let us come around the corner even more. So these chisels are all about um, hollow, hollow vessels. Now, one of the things that's worth talking about is on the carbide on these, we can go two different ways. We can go with a standard carbide cutter or what is called a negative rake cutter. I do have the negative rake cutters on here. And the reason is that we would use the negative rake cutters definitely on um, anything that's made out of epoxy. If you've done a, if you do a bowl that's made out of resin. I'm also using the negative rakes today because this bowl is Indian rosewood and it is a very, very hard wood. And the other benefit to the negative rakes is that when we get against a, up against a hard and dense wood like this, they're going to perform much better, less catchy, less grabby, much easier to work with. The other tool that we're going to have a look at is a parting tool. And in particular with this parting tool, it's got a very thin curve to it. And when we get to this, we're going to change projects. And I'll talk more about what I see as the benefit to a thin curve parting tool like that. So one thing, and I, was, I, I pointed this out earlier, because being a newbie like, and, and not getting the feel for these tools too, I, I did like that they, they throw the label, they have labels on here. Yeah, so we... kind of help you set up too, which is... I love on it's this, so. cool because we do have to be careful about um, how much or how little we're cantilevering the tool past the tool rest and too little would be on these hooks. We don't want to be way out here on the tool rest because we're not going to have the stability that we want. So they've clearly marked this to this is your zone. So here we have stability. If we get way out beyond this point on the tool rest, we're going to have too much leverage out here and it's going to be not safe to use the tool. So Matt's right. It's really nice when you're learning. Yeah. Um, instead of trying to gut your way through that, it's giving you a clear distinction, a clear marking of where we want to be. Cause there's nothing like destroying a nice tool right over yeah, the we don't, we don't want to do that. Yeah. And these are massive too. Like this is a, there's a lot to hold on to. It's a great tool. Yeah. There's, I like it. Um, now with this bowl, we're talking about hollow vessels, hollow forms. And I do have, I've done a lot of hollow forms. And on this one, um, I intentionally went with a much bigger neck on this than I normally would. Typically on a hollow form, I'd be in somewhere around two inches or so or less. And you can imagine, especially on a narrow opening like that, the necessity of then having these tools so you can reach in. For tonight, I specifically open this up wider than I normally would so that it would be easier for you to see the cutting action on the tool. If I have a really narrow neck on this, when I'm reaching in there, you can't see what the tool is doing. So here's what's going to happen. We're going to start out your hollowing with this tool, and we would come in and reach as far as we can, get as much wood as we can out with this. And in this case, with the nature of this bowl, I can get some of my tool rest inside there to give me some additional support. So just like I normally would, I'm going to go ahead and start with this one, and then we'll look at the transition to the other tools. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm.
One of the things that's cool about this, I like when I see um, shavings coming off instead of dust, because that tells us we have a nice sharp tool and shavings means, uh, we're back to the S word, uh, shavings means less sanding when this whole thing is done. So it's great seeing those big curls come off. So this tool starts to open this up and we're gonna reach in like I was just doing there. Now again, on a real narrow neck, we would get to a point where the geometry of this is such that I just can't do any more work with this because as I come across the inside of the bowl, this part of the chisel would start to hit part of that narrow neck. Again, I intentionally went with a big opening so you could see that cutting action. So now when we get to that point where the geometry is, I'm running out of space, then we're gonna go to the next tool. And it is important to use these correctly, like we were talking about just a little bit ago, correctly being this flat is gonna sit on the tool rest and that helps keep this nice and stable. And the line on here is telling me not to cantilever it out too far. It's helping me watch what I'm do, doing. So then with this tool, we can start coming around that corner and undercutting is what is the way to think about this. We're gonna undercut this rim in order to start turning this into a hollow vessel. And then the natural progression of things will be, I'll get to a point where because of the hook that's available on this chisel, I can only get so far. So then we're gonna get more reach, additional reach by going to this hook where I can do more undercutting. Matt, is there a, a hollow vessel in your future? Um, I made a little one. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Yeah. I got. I got to invest in some more tools. You know? <laughs> Small baby steps. Yeah, it's a. Uh, the hollow vessels are challenging, um, but they're really fun to do. It's so cool when they come out right, and and really um, with conventional lathe chisels, there's just no good way to reach around the corner like I did here and start undercutting that rim. So uh, we do have a question. Um, Fire away. If, if a negative rake is so good, is there any reason to go and use regular carbide? That's a, it's a great question. So um, the first chisel I used tonight for reaching straight in still has a standard carbide on it. And I did this on purpose, and then I forgot to mention it. The other two, the hook tools, both have the negative rake. You may have noticed that on that first cut, it was a little bit more aggressive. It was taking a little bit more wood off. So... The, the dynamic of what's happening here is that when I go in this way with this tool, I'm cutting face grain. And face grain is easy to cut. When I come around the corner and I'm going this way, now I'm, in, I'm hitting end grain because the grain is going this way 50% mm -hmm. of the time. End grain is harder to cut and this is a hard wood. So I'm specifically running the negative rake on these because of that end grain. So... That's a long answer that didn't really answer the question yet. So the answer <laughs> is, um, in a wood that isn't this hard, I would want to run the standard cutters yeah. because I would hollow faster. Right. It's more aggressive. It's, it's more aggressive. Yeah. And then, and then the downside is it's more aggressive. So when, <laughs> if you're up against a resin, you're, yeah. if, you're, if you've not tried negative rake on resin yet and you're getting all sorts of catches, all herky-jerky catches as you cut, that's why, is because they're they're – too aggressive and it's really yeah. easy to hang them up. And again, on a really hard, dense wood, I mean, this rosewood is beautiful, 
um, and it's it's going to polish up amazingly when it's done. Um, but the negative is it's so hard and dense. It's it's we really are benefiting from um, the negative rake giving us a kinder, gentler cut that's much easier to handle. Yeah. So so the answer is honestly, you're going to go back and forth between the two depending on what you're doing. If I if I can use a standard cutter and cut more quickly, I'm going to do that, but not at the compromise of having a bunch of catches. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Let's, uh, I'm going to change projects so we can show the other cutter and then the other tool. So if there's anything else, I don't know, you want to talk about well, any I mean, questions that are um, turning related questions we're getting? So or? Kevin asks, what's a good beginner lathe? And I know this is slightly off topic and I, I can... For me, it, and I'm going to answer that expert on lathes by any means, but Oops, I'd say any, any lathe you can afford is a good beginner lathe, right? That seem accurate? Um, or Probably, yeah. I mean, I, I would say that it's, it's all, it all depends. If you can get into turning, I'd try, try to get the, the biggest lathe you can get for your money, but it's a tough question, so... I just thought I, I like the question because I, I put a lot of thought into this over the last couple of months. Because, like I said, I just bought my lathe. But um, so, Kevin, it's it's really going to be you're going to have to just look and see, like because you don't know. You got to figure out how much size, how big of a footprint you have, what you're going to be turning. If you're just gonna, if you're going to turn pens, you know, you could go with something like a little midi lathe. Um, there's there's a lot of options out there. So. Okay, <laughs> good talking because in that time, yeah, I'm ready. So I figured I figured I could answer that question. Here's what we've got going. <laughs> I'm making a lidded box. And what's going to happen, the sequence of events, is the box is to a point where I can part the lid off. And the lid will then again become integral to the box when it's all done. This is a case where... I really, really like these thin curve parting tools because when this is done and it has finish on it, because I made it all from one piece, this is cherry, the grain is going to flow top to bottom. And the less wood I have to take out in order to part the lid, the better grain flow I'm going to have across this. So I'm going to just turn without talking here, but I'll tell you what I'm about to do. The first thing I'm going to do is use this tool in order to create a shoulder on the bottom of the lid. And eventually when the bottom of this thing gets hollowed, that shoulder is what will engage in the hollow in order to keep the lid on. Right below that shoulder then, I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna start to part it. And then at the very end of that, when it's real close to being done, I'll take the tailstock out of the way and we'll just part the lid right off of this thing. So step one, a little bit of a shoulder. Hmm. It's curious. That's where it'll engage in the base. Now we can part. And then the reason I left the tailstock in place initially is it allows me to be a little bit more aggressive. Let me move this. You got it. Come on, baby. There we go. <laughs> it lets me be a little bit more aggressive with my cut. Thank you, sir. Uh huh. Um, by having that in place, but now when we're ready to finish, I don't want to have the lid caught between my tool and the tail set. Tell by the sound, it's getting close. A little higher pitch. 
Oh, it smells. It smells really good. No. Cherry is a wonderful wood. You can smell that cherry for sure. Yeah. Nice. And this is a carbide cutter too. Correct? Yeah, yeah, and that's what. Um, thank you for uh, bringing that up. And yeah. I just as I was cutting, I was thinking I forgot to say that. <laughs> um, like other easy wood tools, this is another. It's a carbide tip and replaceable, so we don't sharpen any of these when their cutting life is done. They're going to swap the tip out altogether. So one of the things that's cool about that in the world of turning is um, you're you're at the lathe turning instead of at a grinder sharpening. Mm -hmm. So um, it keeps you doing what you like the best, which is cutting wood. Yeah. On this one, what? Does that whole end piece come off or is yep. it just that? Yep. Okay. So that all slides out. Yep. yep. And then, um, I don't know, if, can we get a close up of this? Some, uh, Frank is asking if we could have a close up of this tool, just the first one you use. So that. Sure. I'm going to set it there. So I'm out of Nick's way. Yeah. Did he like of the tip? Is that did uh, specify? Frank, he just said, could you show a close up of the first chisel you used? Okay. So I figured, uh, need. hop in there quick and. All right, any other uh, turning or easy wood related questions we should jump on? Um, just, uh, there's a lot of like woodworking questions, like newbie, like kind of new, you know, questions. That's, we're going to, we can get, go down a ton of rabbit holes, getting into all that stuff. Um, there's a lot of great sources out there. Woodworkers Guild, it's a great source for that kind of Thank stuff. You. So um, for this, we're kind of just want to stay specific to like easy wood tools. Yep. So yep. just FYI. <laughs> All right, if we're set with easy wood. Oh, did I pull that out of your frame too fast, Nick? Are you happy? Okay. All right. Yeah. Then from here, let's walk this way. Awesome. Do you need those? No? Oh, yeah. Uh, in a fun. little bit, yeah. You got that. I'll let you do that. I'm just here for entertainment purposes, right? Okay. Ew. Oh, and there was actually, while we're still moving, there was a question about chips coming out of the Woodmaster. Um, so they said, they asked if the, the chips coming out of the Woodmaster, the, if our dust collection was full. And I just, I, the way I think it, it's just a lot of chips for the dust collection. To, to well, and it's, um, my, uh, on my dust collector, my, the dust collector that runs a planer also runs a, um, bunch of other tools. And one of the things I'm negligent about is um, it, it's got a huge filter sack mm. that goes from the dust collector up to the ceiling. Um, and what I need to do every once in a while is knock, it'll cake on the inside with fine dust. And that's what they're supposed to do yeah. is big stuff falls in the bag and then the filter on top limits little stuff. Um, so um, every once in a while I need to remember to shake the filter yeah. and then it's like watching flour fall off of there. And it's, it's a very easy equation with dust collectors or with shop vacuums for that matter. If air can't get out, air can't get in. Mm -hmm. So on a shop vacuum, it's that the, your filter on that clogs with fine stuff and then it's going to lose some of its pull on a dust collector. Same deal. If it can't blow air, if it can't exhaust air through that filter, then it can't pull air in. So I noticed that we had a little, we were suffering from a little CFM loss there because I should have cleaned my filter right before we did but this. But it, it looked like there was dust coming off of there. It was very minimal. Like it, it still collected it. It sucked yeah. it up pretty good. It was, yeah. there, we took a lot of surface off that board. So I'm going to do just a little scrolling to see. Um, Jake has got a question about here about explaining negative rake. So let me just grab, and I'll, I'll ask you, Nick, to do a tight shot again. And I will set this still. And actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the other one right behind it. So if you're framed up about there. Okay. Um, negative rake in the front, standard cutter in the back. And we've got that extra bevel introduced onto the negative rake. And that's really the geometry here that's making this work. This is the super layman's, which is me, um, explanation of this. Um, 
is that by changing that dynamic of the shape difference between those two, again, standard cutter, this is the one I was using on the face grain cuts where it was cutting more aggressively versus the negative rake um, that I would use. It was helping me on the end grain cuts and it would help me in resin. Um, those are the shape differences between those two. Yeah, when you when you look at that chisel, it's just it's slightly undercut. Yep. So it's got two angles. All right, and then um, Katie has put a uh, link for Easy Wood Tools on that we just wrapped up with, and our next candidate is Shopbot Tools. Is a CNC company. Let me take that over here. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. And very specifically. We're going to use the HandyBot today. And CNCs have come into the marketplace. You've got one in your shop, right? I do, yeah. Um, I've got a few here. Um, a few. And, well, because I teach CNCs, <laughs> so that's why I have more than one. Jealous. Um, <laughs> and in most cases, the machine that Matt has, the machines that I have, we're talking about a CNC machine with a bed, and you put material on it, and the material is stationary, and a gantry, a router, or a spindle moves around. So one of the limitations is um, the size of the bed, right? You can only put something so big right. on your CNC. Um, and if I run into a scenario where I would like to take advantage of CNC capabilities, which is I, I can say, make this cut this deep, this shape, this size, for example, I want to put an inlay in the middle of a wooden floor, or I've got a big, big tabletop, as big as my workbench, and I want to put a butterfly in it or some other kind of inlay. That's an occasion where being able to take the tool to the work instead of the work to the tool is going to be a benefit. So the HandyBot, that's part of its deal, is that this is a CNC. It's a portable CNC, and I can take this to a job site. I can put it in the middle of a floor, or here in my shop, when I'm done with it, I'm not worried about a footprint because I could tuck this under the bench and put it away. So in the world of capabilities, let's have a look at, there's a, um, a 3D carving. I, I want to make sure people understand that we're going to do some really simple work on this today, <laughs> and that's primarily just because of machine time. Yeah. Um, but this, we can do a carving like this on this machine, just like Matt or I would do on our yeah. stationary machines. Yeah, and I mean, I can take this, because I, I do a lot of live edge work, big big tables and whatnot. Like, it's like you said, so something that's you know a huge piece of wood, and I can just drop it right in the middle of it, and it's great. Yeah, yeah. and it, that could be, it could be as simple as you want to carve your initials into the back of it, because you're proud that you made the table, yeah. or cutting bow ties in is so common today. And, and with that, with something like this, we could introduce any shape of bow tie that you want because mm -hmm. you're not limited to the notion of um, I have to somehow hand cut the the plug yeah. and the recess because we're gonna we could power cut everything with the CNC. Yep. So one example is um, something like this. Another example I have is this sign. And part of the reason I did this is because the, the cutting envelope, the cutting window in this machine is six inches by eight inches. And I don't want you to think, as a result, you can only do stuff that's six by eight. So this is about six inches in this direction, about 20 inches. The lettering is about 20 inches in that direction. And that's done with V-Carve software through what's called tiling. So you cut a portion, move it over, cut a portion, move it over. In fact, the tool comes with, it comes on a backer board and that backer board turns into a jig where when you're doing something like this, imagine the handy bot is sitting right here and I cut tile number one, tile number two, tile number three. And this, this board could be 30 feet long and I can tile it, tile it, tile it in order to make the sign I wanna make. So, um, so that part's cool is we have those capabilities. The other thing that's cool... I was going to go back to that too. Oh, little. I'm sorry. No, no, you're fine. Fire it, away. With that, because also, for me, if you think about like doing a big chunk of crown molding or something that you wanted to 
you know, replicate a piece of Cromwell which you had in a 3D model and you had a 3D model that you could do a 30 foot piece with a 3D carving going all the way across, which is yeah, nice because, yeah. you know, have, being able to do that capacity, it, it's not, there's not many machines out there that'll do that. Yeah. So. Um, another neat feature of this is we can run this a couple different ways. I can take my laptop and I can ethernet cable that right into the machine and I can use that to drive what's gonna happen here. I can also do it with a device, an iPad, a phone. And the way this works is that what we're seeing here, the, the brain of this is in the machine. But through the iPad, through my laptop, through my phone, I'm accessing that brain and telling it what it is I want it to do. So in this case, like I said, we're gonna do a really simple chunk, a little simple piece of work here. And this is really cool. Like if you have a shop where kids come in and out of your shop, this would be a really fun thing for them to do, which is to choose this app. And then because Matt Coppersmith is here, <laughs> we're going to do M C this drawing you, just became can you a heart around it too with an arrow. <laughs> well, no, I could, but I can't. Yeah, not anymore. Well. Um, <laughs> This drawing just became a tool path for the handy button. It, it's that it's simple. so cool. So when I press submit and then a play button, and I'm going to put my hearing protection in first, this is going to cut. So let's do a little behind the scenes here. And if you would be so kind, Matt, as to give us dust collection. I can. Ready? Hit it. Magic. So live woodworking, we'll do the big reveal here. But I, I think I just did your MC over the practice MC I did before. We so it's gonna be it's gonna be it's gonna be a wild looking MC. Yeah, we're we are kind of superimposed there. Oh, I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna go again just because I want to show that it's I, I mean there's a bunch of MCs we did, on yeah, already. Yeah, we uh, <laughs> we did a little bit of practicing earlier. All right, MC, hearing protection. I, I jumped the gun on the, the- That's okay. You know? I can talk over a Prepared, I'm prepared. <laughs> Press the go button. All right, now we can do the reveal. Yeah. And now we have that MC that I just drew with my finger, and then here it is cut into our material. Now, in addition to, I'm, I'm using like the simplest of the apps that's available there. Um, there are apps already set up where if you wanna cut a circle, you just put in the parameters of the circle and press the go button. There are a lot of functions there that have been set up ahead of time that make it really user friendly to use. Um, a great question would be got a few uh, questions coming in too. Okay. So whenever you're ready, uh, well, let's go ahead and do those. Well, yeah. So, we'll um, guest forty seventy seven asks us if it's use standard G code, which it's using B carve for the yeah. So my, I mean, I, I guess it's using G code, and I I, yeah. and I don't mean to sound stupid about this because I use CNCs <laughs> all the time, but the way I use them is I think the same way you do. Yeah. I design in Vcar. I pick the ShopBot post processor and I, and I send that post processor tool path to the unit and it cuts. Yeah. So, so it's technically using G code, but you're not, I'm not editing G code. You're not creating a specifically a G code program. Which if you want to edit it, if you create a file and you want to edit it, you can. Um, but you don't, we're not programming a CNC. Yeah. And then he also asked the question, and I'm just going to throw out there, we're going to show you the, how you're going to be able to move this around and do something bigger than the footprint. What a lovely segue. 
in on a large table. Okay, that yeah. was his other. Okay, that's his other question. But then also Dennis asked, could he carve an outline of a dog and fill it with epoxy? And absolutely, you could. Yeah. It's, yep. that's, that is, that's probably one of the big things I do with my CNC is I carve stuff out, fill it with epoxy. Yeah. So. Yep. So you could, um, I mean, imagine here, Oh in, yeah. in this case, <laughs> this was a 90 degree V bit that cut these letters. But if I had done that with a quarter inch straight bit, they'd be square bottomed and we could pour epoxy over that and, or into it, um, and fill all that in. Same with whatever shape it is that you want to make an epoxy thingy out of. They couldn't see the results. They oh, could. so okay. <laughs> so we can do this, and Nick is with us. This is the one we just did. I played with it a few times with my own initials. Yeah, we did so. a little. Uh, <laughs> we did a little cutting ahead of time. All right. Now let me give you this, and we'll talk yeah. about bigger stock. So it's a great question of. Um, I want to register this in a bigger plane. So. The way that works is we use um, basically like a story stick is what this is. And here's our, here's the four by eight sheet that we're about to cut. And we get that story stick in place. And I want to thank Carl for the heads up on the results thing. So appreciate that. And then on the handy bot, the way this works is that We've got an index of V's in my story stick, and there's a positive V sticking out of the handy button. This then comes in, and imagine I've tiled a tool path. So this comes in, boom, I'm registered in that first V. I press T1 or T2, tile number two, it cuts. Then when it's done, I come over and the distance from two to three is the width of my tile. Press the go button for tile three and it cuts tile four. We're just going to continue that process like a, just like a gear. We're cogging from one to the next, to the next, to the next, running our subsequent tiles. That gets us east to west or west to east. Um, then to go north and south, we're just going to build out in the same direction and that'll depend on uh, that's our first tile in that direction second tile in that direction so that lets us step out further and further from uh, this would be basically your x y zero is right here and then that lets us go in the x direction these let us tile out in the y direction and you can go as far with that as you need to go depending on the size of the project you're doing. right and if you're in the middle of a floor Double face tape is going to hold that down to the floor. Then you do the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kevin asked, does the system come ready to go? Uh, yeah. So it was, um, I don't know, it's very ready to go. The, the router was in place. There's no assembly on this, really. Um, it was bolted to the board that became the jig for the through cut um, for that tiling. Mm -hmm. um, I got to think a second. And that was about it. The router was in it. Um, I was, I don't know, 10 minutes after, I don't know, more than that, 20 minutes after I was out of the box, it was running. Yeah. So, yeah. And you don't just have to use V-Carve on it either. It can, it's any other kind of. Fusion 360. Yeah. Uh, the also, carving apps. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Let's see. All right. Are you, are we set? I'm going to scroll down here a little bit. Is that the one? Yeah, no, I think we're good. Oh, uh, what, what is the maximum, max plunge depth? Oh, maximum Z is, I don't know, but you know what? Katie's going to put up the link for ShopBot and HandyBot. Yep. Yeah. Katie, she, Katie already put up the link. She's already that. got the link up. Yeah. And that is a spec that I do not have off the top of my head. I can't, just can't remember it. Yeah. So, but it will be on the website. Yeah. And they do supply these templates. So the guest 4077 asked if they supply the templates. You can get them from ShopBot. Yep. So they... They don't send just a design or a, 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 file. a file. They send the actual templates, right? Yep. So, yeah. Okay. I think that's all we got on that one. Yeah. All right. I think I might just stay here. 
you can go around me. You're in, a, you're in your happy place? Yeah, I, I mean, because you're going to have more on this side, right? Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Just move around me. Thank you. <laughs> the next thing we've got going here is tight bond. And um, I'm waiting for glue to dry is, you know, we should be patient because we're woodworkers. Yeah. But I get impatient waiting for glue to dry. So this is a new product from Tight Bond that's called Speed Set. And in other Tight Bond products, the recommended clamping time is typically 30 minutes or more, maybe 30 to 60 minutes. And on Speed Set, it is about 15, it is not about, it is 15 minutes. The other thing that's very interesting with Speed Set, and you know, you kind of feel like if I'm getting, if I'm gaining here, what am I getting? Right. Yeah, right. What's interesting with speed set is we're we're reducing clamp time, so we're gaining speed, and it's actually a stronger glue joint than Type On Original. The PSI strength of speed set yeah, is higher than um, Type On Original, so yeah. it's cool. That's there's not there's not a compromise there, and then there's another cool G Wiz factor involving black light that uh, we'll show in a little bit. Yeah. No, I, I you know. This, this glue itself, yeah, like you said, the waiting for glue to dry, it's always, it's, that's the kind of the bane of when you're working because it, it disrupts your flow. Well, and, and and probably for most people, they only own X number of clamps. Right, right. So the, the funnel point in the project, if you're doing a kitchen with 20 doors, yeah. the, the, the neck on the funnel becomes how many clamps do I own and how many doors can I yeah. do up at one time? So, I mean, and doors would be a great example where, um, if I can reduce my clamp time by half, then I can get doors going that much more. Right, right. And, and yeah, it just becomes, you can keep your, your process working faster yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. Not everyone has a whole wall of clamps. Yes. Are you pointing at me? It's, I mean, <laughs> I think I've already posted that, you know, I do, I do every few, time. I do own a few clamps. Um, that's because <laughs> I have classes in here. I do own a few clamps. I have, a, I have quite a few clamps myself, so I can't um, complain. <laughs> so one of the things that's noteworthy is that at, at this time of this particular release, this live stream, um, speed set is only available in gallon bottles. So I have transferred it to a condiment jar from a grocery store. <laughs> um, it will be available in eight ounce bottles in before too much longer. Yeah. So it'll be available in, in more standard consumer sizes pretty quick. So let's just, I'm going to throw a little glue on here just so people get a feel for the viscosity. Yeah. Just that, that feel of it. Stuff. Um, then we'll look at, did you kind of the G whiz factor that is so cool. Yeah. Cause I, it, it, it still has the same kind of viscosity as yeah. the, like type on their type on original and yeah. Handles very yeah. similar to other glues. Similarly. That's the key word. Real <laughs> standard edge to edge glue up in Walnut. And 15 minutes from now, we could take those clamps off and, yeah. and be set. Um, so the other thing, though, that um, maybe you've never run into this, but I have, is um, if you have glue residue on a piece, you have you have effectively pre-finished that piece. You've, right. you've got a spot where it's not wood anymore because now it's got a film of glue on it. Right. And it can be tricky... Um, you know, not on a flat glue up like this, but on at my, I'll tell you what my worst one was, was a chair, 28 mortise and tenon joints. Mm -hmm. And it was so tricky to go through joint by joint and make sure that there was no squeeze out surrounding right. that before I put finish on to make sure that I was ready to put finish on. Well, and, and the hardest thing is it's, if you don't like, you're going to see it the moment you put finish on. Yeah. Like, it's not a matter of like, you can inspect that for me it's always like i look and i've done as much work as i can and you know yeah it still pops yeah. up where well, and, and when glue dries clear yeah right <laughs> right it can be pretty hard to identify so a cool aspect of what we're what we've got going with speed set is that they've added uh well, a chemical to it i guess <laughs> um, they've made it such that when I put it under a black light or when I, so this is a black light in my hot little hands available from home centers or Amazon. When I shine a black light on that, 
I've intentionally left, that's a thumbprint of glue right there. That glue residue glows under the black light. So imagine when I'm wrapping up a project, I'm wrapping up that Morrison yeah. tenon heavy chair, and I could walk around with this light and know 100% conclusively that if I have that showing up, that I need to do a cleanup. And if I don't get any of that, I, yeah. I know I'm ready to go with finish. Yeah. And I know, I mean, in here, we, we've got a lot of light. It's pretty bright. And you probably, in your situation, when you're looking at it, it, it may not pop. Like, I can see it. It's popping right there. But if you shine it back on this stuff, when you're seeing, because you can easily see how bright it is on this. Yeah. That's what it's showing up to me here. But, like, on the camera, you might not be able to see it. But it's it's it pops right out. So yeah. It's a... Uh, and, it, and two, if we turned some of the lights off, yeah, so we weren't so quite so bright right yeah. now, um, it'd be even more obvious. Yeah. So let's take a second. Well, I'm going gonna, gonna to hop into some questions about speed oh, set ahead, real quick. Um, so B. Hansen asks, what is the open time? And I actually didn't look that one up. So. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I don't, I'm off the top of my head, I don't know. So I'm hoping it says on the bottle. Yeah. I can't see the bottle because I'm. Like you didn't bring your specs. I don't. I just had to start wearing glasses. But um, so I got that question. That's and then another person asked if it's FDA uh, food safe. If it's approved food safe. You know, it's a great question because a lot of the type on products are. Um, it is not. I don't see it specifically stated as food safe on this one, and. For instance, so on, on three, it specifically says non-toxic FDA approved for indirect food content contact. And on this one, it does not say that. So I'm not going to say conclusively. I would double check that on the type on page, mm -hmm. um, which I'm sure Katie has put up for us. Yeah, I um, we, I'm pretty sure she's working on it, but she'll uh, get it up there. And then possibly so, if Katie yeah. can pull up. Maybe look and see. Open time. Yeah, open yeah, time. Yeah, I'm not sure. And I'm going to say, um, based on handling here, and it's, and I, I did some work with this prior to tonight, um, it feels to me like it's got the open time of Type Bond Original, very similar to Type mm -hmm. Bond Original. Yeah. So, and then, um, let's see where to go here. Lost it on me. Oop. Mm, let's see. Oh, um, Cleston asked if it's, if it's water. Um, if it's waterproof or water resistant, interior only. So yeah, which that's that's what the speed set versus, and I mean, I type on original is also interior, interior only, only yep. as well. So it's only it's only the type on three, if I remember correctly, that is the one that's I not only, but I know that in those glues, the type on three is. Well, you're segueing us. Are there other oh, questions? Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry, I jumped ahead, didn't I? That's okay. Yeah. Well, no, it's a great segue <laughs> into what else we're going to talk yeah. about at let's this corner see. of the world. Here. Yeah. Let me see if, uh, let's see, uh, Katie did put up the link for the uh, type on, yeah, cool. for furniture assembly. Yeah, so that's that's what this is ideal for. So, okay. And that's, I think that's, All right, so that's what we have right now. Let's hit this, this interior exterior thing because this question comes up so often and we do have an array of glues to talk mm -hmm. about here. Um, so, um, Type on original speed set that we just talked about. These are going to be interior glues, great for furniture, cabinets, that kind of stuff. When you're going into the exterior realm, type on two, type on three, and or polyurethane. So the um, the difference here, type on two, type on three, water resistant, waterproof. Mm -hmm. So the example I use a lot is. Um, if you're building an Adirondack chair and it's going to be outside, but it's not really going to be soaking wet all the time, yeah. then um, type on two would be fine for that. If you have something where it's really going to be wet a lot, so for instance, a flower box where we put dirt in there and that soil is going to be damp all the time yeah. so flowers can grow, um, type on three is going to be a better choice for that. There is a difference here where type on two does tack faster, shorter open time than type on three. Mm -hmm. So that might also be a factor then in choosing your glues. If you've got lots of parts to work with, um, type on three will give you more open time. Right. Um, polyurethane glue, one of the things about 
these glues, and original is in the same category, is they dry by evaporation. So as moisture leaves the glue, that's when you get, that's how you get curing. The problem with that is if we work with damp woods, um, so for instance, if you're doing an outdoor project out of treated lumber, yeah. like have you ever picked up a piece of treated lumber that doesn't weigh 400 pounds? Right, right. Because it's still dripping wet. Right. Um, these, glue, these glues would cure eventually, but that would really retard the cure time because there's so much moisture in the wood. Polyurethane glue is just the opposite. It needs moisture in order to cure. So one of the benefits of that is exterior glue and um, it'll cure in the presence of moisture. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a good choice for that. And it's also a good choice for non-similar materials. So yeah. um, you were talking about inlay. Another thing I've done with inlay a lot is um, create a pocket and then cut for it like a solid surface mm -hmm. or aluminum or plastic something that's going to yeah. go in that pocket and polyurethane is a glue that would hold those together i i actually use a lot of copper in my stuff and that's i use the polyurethane glue yeah. to inlay copper go figure but yeah so that that actually should answer uh, b hansen's question too because he asked why if speed set is so fast why would i use other glues so that's yeah that they, would be why yeah you got to match your work you know it's it's like picking the right tool for the job you got to match yeah. the the glue characteristics to what it is that you're trying to right accomplish um, and then quickly, we can just go through a couple other things here. Um, bring, bring that pump back just because yeah. I think it's cool. Oh, yeah. Now, again, you know, in this shop, I do a little bit of custom work. I teach classes. I consume a lot of glue. This is a wonderful way to go to refill your glue bottle. So you buy this once, and when it's empty, it goes under here. It's like going to the gas station. Mm -hmm. You can top that off. So the pump system is I, I'm now getting my glue in gallons and then using the pump to keep everything full. So I think that's really cool yeah. if, you, if you consume a good volume of glue. Um, I think that's actually cool because I, I, I like this. I have this as well because I, had, I, I didn't use a lot of glue, and I had the gallon, and it started to cure. Like yeah. I started getting air, so like that was nice to have that pump so it would – You the, weren't opening keep, the bottle. Correct. Like it was, it, was, it stayed it fresher longer. Yeah. So That's a great point. Yeah. Um, then just in some other products that Typon's got – um, dark wood glue, which oddly enough, we would use for dark woods in order to make that glue line a little bit less visible. Mm -hmm. Hide glue, if you are an instrument maker, then you'd be familiar with this. Hide. The benefit to hide glue is it's reversible, where the other glues we've talked about so far would be very, very difficult, if not impossible to reverse. A little bit of heat and a little bit of steam, and we can reverse hide glue. It's one of the reasons... Um, Instrument makers or people who do a lot of veneer work use hide glue is anticipating someday I got to get inside that guitar and fix a cracked brace. Someday I've got to take that destroyed veneer off the top of the table and replace it with a new piece of veneer. Mm -hmm. And we can easily do that with hide glue. Um, Matt and I are both turners, bowl turners. And if you're going to, I think, turn bowls, you got to have cyanoacrylate, CA glue in your <laughs> shop. How do you say that? Cyanoacrylate. That's nice. Good job. <laughs> CA glue. I, I, I practice. Yeah, CA glue is the way it is the default. Yeah. Um, it's, it dries very, very fast. Different viscosities available. Um, it already dries fast. You can add an accelerant to it, mm -hmm. so it dries even faster. Um, but it's a great way on a bull turning to do a repair if you have a little bit of a crack in it. It's a great way to bond dissimilar objects. They're just, it's a thing that, once you have it in your shop, yeah, like find you keep yeah, oh, finding yeah. stuff that you can right. use it for. I mean, I, so I use I use the CA glue. I use the Type Bond CA glue for my pens. So I use it, you know, glue in a brass point, barrel, a brass barrel, and a wooden sleeve. Yep, and then I turn it, and then I use the thin set, the thin CA glue for finish. So I'm you know hitting that up there and hitting it with the the yeah, and, accelerant. And CA glue as a finish is another great point. Yeah, yeah that's another great application. So yeah, it's, it works great. And then uh, thick and quick. So um, a great application for this in cabinet work, if you're putting a piece of crown molding on the top of a cabinet and we use other glues, it's pretty easy to get that glue on there. And as you're getting the crown molding in place, it starts running um, quick and thick, just like its name says, is it's a much thicker viscosity glue. So it's way less prone to running mm -hmm. on you like that. And um, extended time. So it, that 28 mortise and tenon chair would be a great example. If you yeah. get into a scenario where 
you can't assemble in subsections. Things really have to all come together at once. Um, this will give you more open time to get all of those parts brought yeah. together. Yeah. Um, so guest 1417, which glue is best when the majority of the surface is being, when the majority of the surface being glued is end grain, which that's a tough question, right? I mean, that's. Well, yeah, I, don't, I would say I would pin that more on what, what is it you're doing with that? So yeah, yeah. if it's end grain, that's going to live inside, um, it's a picture frame. Um, original would be fine. If it's end grain, that's part of an outdoor project. It's got to be two or three. Yeah. And either one of those would be fine. But you want to be aware that it's going to, it's going to suck that glue in. Yeah, right? It's way so, more, um, it's end grain soaks in a lot of glue. Yeah. So there's yeah. just, you gotta be, I think more, maybe not liberal with the glue, but just understanding that that end grain is just going to suck that glue yep. in and yep. you don't want to starve your glue joint. But so. you can still, you can still go toward application more so that how the project will be used yeah um, more so than just the fact that it's angry yeah and then randa jerry asks do you recommend sizing your glue ups or is that unnecessary well so there's we're back to the end grain thing so oh, yeah uh, um an approach some people take on end grain is to size the end grain which is um in some cases people dilute the glue maybe 50 percent and brush that on like mm. paint and it kind of seals the end end grain so that when you do your final glue joint, it's not capillarying up. It's okay. not soaking so much glue up into it. Um, and it, it depends. Um, I would say I don't do it much more commonly than I do. So I've, yeah. I've put 11 billion mitered picture frames <laughs> together without sizing the end grain. And as far as I know, I've never had a failure. Cool. Yeah, I think that's... Any other gluey a, stuff? Let me make a final view here. And yeah, and Katie did uh, put on a link to type on. So take a look at that. Oh, oh yeah. Then I think that's what we got. All right. Versus other type on glues. Oh, uh, David asked, what is the open time? This is versus this versus other glues. I know this was 15 minutes we're saying. No, I don't know that we know. Oh. Clamp time was 15 minutes. Oh, open, open time. Open time was sorry. the question we didn't That's right. have that the we answer didn't. for. Sorry. Yep. That's it. All right. Yeah. Let's move Mosey on. over. I like glue. It's a necessary <laughs> thing. I can say that in the interim here. It doesn't sound weird. <laughs> well, this is the this is the perfect place to say you like glue. Right? I know, I know. I got my soda. Well, Matt, we have arrived at the castle. It's uh, the castle being the brand of the next, the brand name, the manufacturer of the next product we're going to talk about. Specifically, we're looking at the Castle One Ten, and th this is this is a very interesting thing for me. Because I was, um, I was a production manager of a commercial cabinet shop for a very long time. And um, we did not use pocket joinery. We castled parts together. So for us, oh, yeah. the verb was, the, the verb for using pocket joinery was castle. Because we had a, a pneumatically driven castle pocket joinery machine in the shop. And that's all our face frames. Many, 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 many parts got put together. Which is a, it's a massive machine. I yeah. mean, it's a, it was a big machine yeah. for doing that. Yeah, big and expensive, and you got to have an air compressor to drive it and everything. So it, one of the things that's really neat to me is when we see um, things come from industry to where they're available at a consumer level, mm -hmm. and it's, it's time-tested in industry. Um, but now here's a model that I don't need a compressor. It is router-driven. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but it's a it's a company that's got a really deep and long history in right. this category. So what we're looking at here is the ability to do pocket joinery. And this slot, these two slots, are actually cut by a router and a router bit. And then to complete our pocket joinery, we've got holes in the end of this, and that's going to allow our screws to exit. So there's a couple things going on here. Um, one is that we've got holes here. So in this pocket joinery method, 
we're not asking the screw to go through the end grain. So mm -hmm. in other words, we've got a pocket that stops at a fixed point yeah. with a hole, a through hole. And so when we put these parts together, when I join this frame, I don't have a little nubby here that's either caused by the drill bit or by the screw exiting that can then prevent these parts from coming together. So mm -hmm. it's a little cleaner in that way. A, a really big thing with this particular machine is that it puts the pocket at only three degrees. And that is, I've got a thing right. that I cut. There it is. Um, so the, here's one, Nick, if you get in on that guy. Cut a pocket and then did a section cut through it. And then I highlighted it with felt tip just to make it easier to see. <laughs> um, but when we talk about three degrees, it's about the angle at which that screw is going to exit this. So intuitively, we can guess that the steeper the angle on that screw, the more likely it's going to be that when I join it to another piece, those parts are going to have a tendency to climb. The more, the closer we can be to parallel, the easier it is to get these parts together. We really mitigate the opportunity for these parts to creep as we're putting them together. And we're going to assemble a joint in just a little bit. So you'll see that come into play. Then in addition, we've got a couple other things going on here. Um, I'll spin this around so we can have a look. So on the machine, there's a scale here. And when our material comes in, one way that we can position our work is by watching where on the scale it is. The high spot in the middle is an indicator of where the pocket's going to get cut. So if I just want to be dead center, I can eyeball that. Or I can use the scale relative to an edge to control that. Can we tip that forward a little bit just so, because yeah. I think it's just yeah. a kind of a higher angle. Yeah. So that'll give us one way that we can get our material in here is basically kind of freehanding it. In other words, I position it and we'll talk about clamping it in place in a second. And then I position it for a single cut, position it for another cut, good to go. If you're doing a lot of repetitive cuts, if I'm going to do many, many, many pieces, I can add stops. With the stops, we would get this set so that we have a left stop, lock that in place. We have a right stop, lock that in place. And now every time we come up to this machine, we can hit a stop, come in, lock our work, make the cut, unlock, hit the other stop, lock our work, make the cut. So this in a highly repetitive operation where we're yeah. doing lots and lots and lots of cuts gives us that opportunity. To it's all about power. the production. I yep. mean, you're, you're, you're just creating a, a real fast production. Yeah, you know. it's, a, it's a bulletproof way to get them located without, yeah. or, you know, maybe you're a scenario where, um, I'm not going to cut these. Somebody who else who's working in the shop with me is going to. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't have to worry, are they going to get the material in the right spot? Right. Because you just hit the stop, hit the stop. Yep. Another thing. Which that, that, I mean, for me, it's like any, anything that's going to speed up that process. And simplify it. And simplify it. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it, yeah. I mean, not speed it up in a bad way, but speed it up yeah. where, you know, I can be efficient. That's, that's just, that's money in my pocket. Yeah. So. Um, while we're here, let's have a look at, um, we got a quick release system, a clamp system here. So the way this works is that it's very user friendly when the handle is here and let's just back that off altogether. The way that we set pressure on this is in this position, bring that pad down until it's kissing the top of our material. Light touch. Yep. There. That's in a position then where I have the right clamp pressure mm -hmm. on that. And then, same deal while we're in that kind of that view, we can look at that piece of three quarter inch stock. Working with thin material, we can put this shim in place. And that is going to allow us to get into that thinner stock. We would do the same thing. Start here, find our material, 
that's going to get us in the right spot to lock that thinner stack in place. Mm -hmm. So again, it's, it's a very user friendly, intuitive setup approach to getting our material in here. How thin, how thin do you, would you want to go well, about around a half inch yeah. or so? I mean, you still want to have a, you want to have meat in the wood to attach the screw to, yeah. you know, you figure the, the screw head's still going to be about a quarter inch to roughly. Yeah. So of, of its own diameter. Yep. So probably half inch. Um, then on this side of the machine, the other thing that we can control, and I've got, oh, it's right in front of me, <laughs> um, is what's called the web of the joint. The web of the joint is how much meat is left from the end of the pocket to the end grain, end of the pocket to the end grain. So that is done with this setting here where change the position, lock it in place, Change the position, lock it in place. Change the position, lock it in place. And that's changing. It's just controlling how far the router bit can pivot up in order to make these cuts. So one of the things that's cool about this is let's say we've got our pocket joinery. And from this end, our thin stock is a great example. We're going into the face of a thin piece. Mm -hmm. This would allow me to back off the cut. In other words, increase the size of the web so that the screw I'm using doesn't accidentally start coming out. Blow off the other side. Yeah. So it lets you, this is going to let you fine tune how much or how little thread we're putting into each of the mating pieces. Right, right. Yeah. And I, th I, mean, I think the essential thing, one of the essential things is that, is that low angle, like you said. Yeah. And then, and just that, the, the low angle, so your, your piece isn't going to shift up and down. And then, yeah, so that's a, that's probably the, probably the biggest. Probably the big low benefit. angle is huge. The yeah, low, the low, which the the, the low angle isn't huge. Mm -hmm. The fact that it has a low angle right, right, is a huge is a huge positive. Yeah, and the way factor. that works, and too, and I mean, and it's also it's portable too. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna show it mounted, and we're, when we when we do it, but you can take it on the job site. You can move it yeah, around. Yeah, and, and we're gonna do that too. We're gonna, yeah, we're gonna make a couple of cuts here. Um, let's do let's cut since we're talking about making yeah. cuts. Um, the other thing, while I can face it toward you because it's not clamped yet, we've got a dust port here. So one of the things we're about to do is get a vacuum in that. Doctor? Dust. Dust Section. port. Suction. And then uh, working with walnut today, we'll do this one. That piece there. And I'm just going to double check my setting here because I played with it so much. Yeah. And while you're doing that, I'm going to look at questions here. Uh, let's see. Uh, we're asked. Yeah, we talked about we talked about the max. Oh, what's do we know a max thickness? Min we, we minimum thickness we talk about about probably about half inch. You don't really want to probably won't want to go any thinner than that. That's a good question. So um, for max thickness, I'm not 100 percent sure, and I would have a look at the specs when Katie puts up their web address. Yeah. Cause I, cause off the top, I don't want to misquote a number. Right. That, that's, that's my thing too. It's like, cause I could see it's like, Oh, it looks like about probably about this thick, yeah. but yeah. You know, anything else before we make noise? Um, nope. I think that's good for right now. Okay. So the, the mechanics of this here is that there's a router in the base. When I push this handle, the router is going to pivot up and then I'm going to drill a hole from this end, and that's how we get the pocket joinery with the hole in. <laughs> that was stage direction. All right.
Pockets are cut. Holes are punched from the end. Now, let's do an assembly, and that's gonna give us a chance to, to talk about screws. So with screws, one of the things that we're, we're using Castle's screws for this device. And they're Torx drive. So one of the things that's nice about that, great positive engagement with the driver tip. They're also a multi-thread screw. So what that means is that I don't have to swap back and forth hardwood versus softwood. The same screw is gonna serve both masters. So I only need to inventory that one style of screw. Um, the head style is also important because of the way this is bottoming out in our pocket. It's really important that we have the right style head on here so we don't run into an issue with the manner in which that screw hits the bottom. So now, making a face frame or similar. Make sure there's no junk on my table because that <laughs> screws up my reference surface. Did you say that they were Torx head screws? Correct. We did talk about that then. And I'm doing that on purpose. A little bit of reverse. And one of the things to notice is I'm not putting a clamp on here. I'm using my thumb as a clamp. That reverse helps that a little bit. So that, it, so that I don't have to worry about that creep as I'm assembling the joint. So what that does is that the screw puts a little bit of a dimple in that mating surface, helps it engage in just that right spot so that when they come together, we're still flush across the face. Um, so we've got that stuff going on. Next thing I'm gonna do is get a piece of melamine in here. So is that anything else there that we should um, well, I guess 4077 is asking that the routers are turning to its lower position by itself, or if you are kind of when you release it. Spring, it's a great spring question. Loaded. Spring loaded. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm manually doing this, but it's doing that. Yeah. And one thing I want to point out, too, is when you were drilling, I don't know, I, actually, I might have missed it, you might have pointed out, but this is actually dimpled. Um, so to find that, help you find to that To find spot. that spot to go, you know, you're going to drill right into the spot there. So, yeah, that's a good point. All right, so let's do um, let's do melamine, and I very intentionally picked melamine for this because it's so much fun. It's heavy, and I like picking up heavy stuff. <laughs> um, no, so the reason I did melamine is because um, if you've tried to cut melamine, you might have struggled a little bit because it's so chippy. So one of the things that's a benefit to the fact that we're doing this with a router and a router bit is the cut quality that we get. So um, if you're commonly putting pocket holes in melamine or plywood or veneered materials, uh, again, router and a router bit right. is giving us really, really good cut quality. So one of the things we just did is we had the machine, the, the 110, clamped to the bench. We brought the work to the machine. So, and the other thing we can do, a big sheet like this would be awkward to handle that way. Right. So we can also bring the machine to the work. And I'm going to, once again, mm -hmm. I'm going to back off my setting because this melamine is probably a slightly different thickness than the walnut. Find that setting again, same way we did before. Clamp this in place. There is on the bottom of the machine here on the table, there's a V. That V is the index, that's the center of my pocket. So that tells me where this action is about to happen. Yeah, let's throw that in here. Oop. And then from there, everything is gonna be the same, it's just downside up. Cool. You're on the outside so they can see your action. 
Mm -hmm. Put it on the outside so you can see the action. There. Yeah? No. <laughs> All right, so then from there, if you can get in on that pocket, Nick. And that's what we really wanted to show there was just that clean cut that we're getting even in melamine, which is so chip prone. Um, and again, because router and router bit, whoop, whoop, making that cut, nice, clean edges on that pocket. All right, let's, I'm going to look at our cheat sheet. I think we got everything. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, we talked test collection. Yeah. Yeah. I'm keeping you on track that way. Okay, yes, I know that you're, poli <laughs> you're policing me. Thank goodness someone is. And we'd be all good if I didn't, wouldn't just leave my Gatorade bottle in line of sight here. So. Right, that's it's not a paid promotion for Gatorade. All right. <laughs> Ready for the next one? I'm ready to move on. All right. Well, yeah. If you were to, so kind as to bring the laptop. I, yes, I will. And I think you're going to, are you going to do a little talking here, Matt? Is that our, is that where we're at? I mean, was I going to talk or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demo for sure, right? Okay, you're going to demo. Yeah. All right. Um, oh. Threw everything down there. Okay. All right. Um, here's where we're at. Next thing we're looking at is a drill Ooh. press table from Where'd Woodpeckers. <laughs> there we go. I'm still not in it, you know. <laughs> the, uh, one, of the, one of the things that is a downside about most drill presses is that they're really good for metalworking. They're not so good for woodworking. So when you go to put larger pieces on here, we're going to drill a door in just a second. Getting the door to balance on those small drill press tables can be problematic. Um, the other thing is that um, drill press manufacturers, unlike most other woodworking tools, really haven't considered adding dust collection to the tool. Right. And this is something um, we're getting a bunch of, I don't know, two for one, six for one, maybe eight for one deals by having a woodpecker's table on right. a drill press here. So we've got a bunch of stuff going on, a bunch right. of features going on. One, inherently the table itself has a lot of real estate. Two, I can increase that real estate by adding, not adding, by opening the wings to further expand the amount of surface we have to set stuff on. Here in the center of the table, that's a piece of MDF, that's disposable, that's replaceable. So of course, by drilling holes, I'm gonna drill into that, drill into that, drill into that, and then eventually when it gets, when it needs to be replaced, it's simple. It's just half inch MDF, put a new piece in there. Stops on the fence so that we can locate our work. I mean, it's heavy duty, like. And it's, yeah, it's an extruded an aluminum fence with measurements on it. So we can use those measurements to locate the mm -hmm. stop. And it also, yeah, it's very rigid. So yeah. if you're dealing with bigger stuff where you're concerned about, pushing against the fence and it may be flexing a little bit. That's not going to happen right. with what we've got going here. And then at the very end of the fence, we're connected to a shop vacuum, which is then feeding through to the center here. And you're going to see in just a second, um, just how efficient that is at collecting stuff. And then part of our other deal, what's cool is a drawer under the table. So your commonly used drill press stuff can live right here. Of course, it closes, so it's not going to get stuff in it that you don't want in it. Um, but it's a really good, easy way to keep stuff handy. How many of us have lost the chuck key for our drill press? Um, <laughs> this is going to automatically give you a really good place to keep that. Yeah. Plus a lot of other things. So I think, Matt, you're going to do the boring part of this. Right? Yeah, I'm ready to go. You're literally going to do the boring. All right. Oh, oh, I got it. I, I'm sorry that I had to explain that. I'm going to go. <laughs> No, I, I know. I, I didn't pick it up first, All the right. first time through. So You you set up here, and then I will uh, give you vacuum when you're ready to go. Yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to be doing, we're going to be cutting the, the hinge holes. Yep, Euro this. hinge holes in a door, yep. 32 millimeter bit. Yep, so we got bit set up. We've already preset the depth that we wanted to cut through. Didn't we? Actually, wait. Yeah, you're good to go. Are we? All right, yeah, we are good. Just wanted to check. 
Make always sure good. Very good at double check so we don't <laughs> punch through a door. Yeah, nice thing we have. We got the, the stop set up. So I'm going to see if I can slide it in. Make sure we're good. Yep. There we go. Then we got the other setup. So we can just come on the other side. And repeat. It's nice because it's just it, how well that dust collection works. It just yeah, I mean it, it pulls it right out of there. You wouldn't think, I mean it's just that little tiny channel, but it it's just really clears that path out. There we go. Yeah, we have about uh, ninety-eight percent of the shavings off of that large bit. Right, ended up in the vacuum instead of piled up on top of the work where we have to deal with them. Yeah, later. getting in the way, getting in, screwing stuff up, and especially if you're going to be doing, if you know, if you start doing, well, yeah, how many, multiply, how many doors? Multiply you know, times a twenty-door kitchen, right? And there's stuff laying all over the place. Yeah, you know, you're going to be. So the other thing I think happens a lot with a drill press is people aren't just punching holes with them. They're also sanding on them. So let's just walk through a setup that I think is another benefit to this, which would be if we're using a little drum sander, what one would do is grab a piece of scrap and Punch a hole in that scrap that's a little bit bigger than the diameter of your drum sander. We'll set that down and lock the quill in a down position. Clamp it, Ted. And then we can bring the fence forward. Now we're not using the fence per se here like we were using it for the door. But well, we're, we're bringing it to proximity here so that when we are for that dust collection option sanding, that we're close enough for that dust collection to help us out. So let's, I'm going to run that for just a second, just as an example of another yeah. benefit to this. Let me check our chat. While we're getting that going. So it's, you know, again, like we talked about with drilling the holes, um, you get in this scenario where we're sanding lots of toys for right. Christmas presents or something, um, and it's pretty easy for that dust to accumulate yeah. pretty quickly. So it's given us that same benefit we had on the Euro hand. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, it goes into anything. Like I've got my shops in my house, so like I want to make sure that that's not getting into my, my lungs and my yeah. system. So yeah. anytime we can get good dust selection, that's essential. Yeah. So. All right. Questions on this one that we should hit? Uh, no, actually, I think we're doing pretty good. There's no. Anyone have any questions on the woodpecker's table? All right. Well, All let's right. let's walk this way and. Yeah, uh, I got laptop. Bring the laptop. Yeah, and we'll see what happens next. We'll see what happens next. It's an adventure. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, and um, Katie has put up the link um, for the woodpecker table, the woodpecker's table that we just worked with. So let's see. I just want to go back through and just see, make sure we've covered all the questions from. I feel like there was one about the woodmaster, but. 
Oh, no, it's just someone commented on uh, your 11 billion picture oh, frames. Oh, 11 billion, yeah. It is. They, you're right. That, they, is a, that is a lot of picture they frames. They question. I, I think there's more of a question of the numbers. <laughs> yeah. But um, it's uh, 11 billion is a very popular number to come out of my mouth. <laughs> I use that a lot, um, which obviously isn't a real number. But eh. I haven't really made 11 billion. That's all right. I don't mind. I'm not going <laughs> to. So you. Uh, you like being um, creative, right? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of it's a, something I do. A little free form, and uh, right. Next thing we're going to talk about is an ArborTech tool, and this is this is a very creative thing. One of the things I like about this is I, I do lots of flat work, and flat work being building cabinets, uh, making chairs, that kind of stuff, and it, it's pretty formulaic and yeah. and a lot of boxy looking stuff, and with ArborTech, we can get into stuff a little bit more like this. And I'm actually, to be completely honest here, um, a friend of mine made this bowl. I did not make this. Um, we'll look at other stuff in a second that I did do. But it speaks to that same thing, which is grab a chunk of walnut. This mm -hmm. particular piece is a piece of walnut crotch, some hollowing on the inside, some shaping on the outside. And it's neat because it's... You're you're looking at the wood. You're seeing right. what does this lend itself to being? Yeah. What what do I want to take away? What do I want to leave? It's nowhere near as formulaic as building a cabinet, right. or building a chair. Yeah. This is. I mean, this is true art. I mean, you're you're the wood is talking to you. It's it's you're feeling it. It's the way it's moving. Oh man. I mean, that's the wood talking to you. Yeah. I just sit in my. I sit in with all my wood, and it talks to me, and I. No, sorry. Well, I, no, I, but no, I, no I, I'm, I'm making fun of it, but I completely agree. I know. It, it's, it's, it sounds hokey when you say when you say it out loud, and you're like, "Oh yeah, the wood's talking to me." But I, I, I don't know how many times it's happened where you know we talked about turning a little bit, and you know when all of a sudden it just takes this shape, yeah. and it's the same thing with this. It's like, and but you can also utilize pieces of wood that normally would have just either gone in the chipper or gone in the trash yeah. or, or you know been yeah. chucked up to burn. So. so we've got we've got a handful of different things to talk about here. Um, this is a new product from Arbor Tech, and it is a tool that is specifically for doing the kind of work that we're about to do. And we've got, if nothing else, a great thing going is the ability to connect, to connect dust collection to this. And you're going to see just in a second, just how efficient that is. So <laughs> we can collect, connect a shot vacuum to it so that we're picking up stuff instead of throwing it all over the floor. The other thing that's really nice is with this leveling guide that we have here, again, what you'll see in a second is that, is that with the turbo plane in place and tools unplugged so I can do this <laughs> with the turbo plane in place, this acts as a guide so that when I'm leveling a slab out, it helps control um, the amount of material I'm taking off. Yeah. And it also helps just stabilize everything so that I'm not going to tip. I'm not going to gouge. Yeah. And we're going to look at just doing a, a small slab that I've got started for this. But so many people are doing live edge work right now, bigger mm -hmm. coffee tables and stuff, uh, log cookies. This would be a great way to take the um, high spots out, level everything out, and and get something you can work with. Because, I mean, who's got a planer big enough for a 30-inch wide live right. edge slab where we can do leveling with a with a tool like this. Yeah, that's what I like about it. Like you can just kind of nicely skate it over the top if you yeah. have like a little gouge or something that and you the, want to take out. Um, in addition to this leveling guide working with the turbo plane, it also works with a sanding disc so we can start, like you normally would, we can start with a more aggressive operation mm -hmm. where we're taking a lot of material off fast. Then we can change to a sanding operation where yeah. we're cleaning that surface up. So. The whole thing comes together as a really, really cool system that um, really makes this, uh, I, I think with dust collection, it makes it a very pleasant experience. And two, just the whole art of doing this free form is a, yeah. is a really neat way to go. And then they also have, we also have uh, where it's a smaller discs where, where you can take the shroud off too. And if you really yeah, want so to get in there. And yeah. So I'm, I'm really concentrating on the leveling guide. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> One of the things we'll see yet here is that when we want to do that hollowing, mm -hmm. we're going to take this off 
and switch oh, to I this. Oh, I jumped ahead. And then, oh, that's okay. Good segue. <laughs> and that's going to allow us to expose yeah. the cutter or the sandpaper yeah. um, so that we can use this portion of the cutter or sandpaper that isn't available when we're inside the leveling guide. Yeah. Like this. So it is, it is, it's a great question because it's, um, it's order of operations where we would want to level mm -hmm. with the more aggressive cutter, the turboplane, then switch to the sander. Then in our case, we're going to level first. Then we're going to take the shroud off and start that hollowing operation. Yeah. Um, which I think we're ready to I think we're ready to go over there and make that happen. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to move a little bit of stuff around. Yeah, I'm going to grab my specs, my eye protection. I have here a lovely piece of box elder. Box elder is an e wood. It's in the maple family. Um, and it's very prone to getting these orangish, reddish stripes in it. And man, it's such a nice contrast against the really light colored wood. So again, order of operations, here's where we're at. I am going to use the leveling guide to start with this operation of leveling this off. On the guide, there's a control. And as I turn this, that controls how much or how little of the cutter or the sandpaper, the turboplane or the sanding, drum, sanding disc, is exposed beyond this point. So I can make my cutter more or less aggressive by dialing this in either direction in order to help the machine control that so I don't have to try to freehand yeah. control that quite so much. the fun part yeah creating you probably need this too yep i'm gonna throw that on um one of the things we found is that bark can zing around a little bit so a full face shield is a good way to go all right and again we're leveling i'm going to use this leveling guide as an outrigger as a guide to help me maintain the control I want to keep this running flat. So a couple things here. Um, we started with, this was chainsaw cut. So the cuts in this were pretty aggressive. Yeah. Uh, pretty yeah. Deep. And um, it hasn't taken much to smooth this out. And I'm not yet at the most aggressive setting. I'm going to set it a little more aggressive just so you can see how that goes. Um, the other thing that's 
pretty amazing, I think, is we've taken, I don't know, maybe almost an eighth of an inch of wood off of right. this. And the chips are, oh. I know, I was all, actually. They're all in there. I know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm actually positively happy about how much I'm not seeing dust. Like, yeah. I actually thought I was still going to kick up yeah, the, some the, chips and stuff. The level of dust collection on this is pretty incredible. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you can just, I was, I was noticing it's like you could, as you started, it's like, oh, it's not really taking a lot off. And then you, as you got over it, that, the, the high spots, it started to go down. And then, yeah. you know, yeah. Then the box elder really started coming out. And, well, yeah. And the other thing I think is cool is you can tell when you're getting a good cut quality in woods that have these kind of shimmers mm -hmm. when you start to see the shimmer from this. So yeah. then you can imagine um, next step sanding, next step finishing. Yeah. I'm really going to get some power. Bring that out. Yeah. Grain. So if, if we're getting that off of this, we know we're really right. getting a good cut quality. Um, I'm going to do just a little bit more with this and then just for the sake of time, we'll jump ahead. But part of it is I'm enjoying this. So I'm going to, right. I'm going to, I'm going to stand here and watch. <laughs> So that with the more aggressive setting on the leveling guide, it let me be a little bit more aggressive. We were taking material off a little bit faster mm -hmm. there. Um, but one of the things that's cool is that with that outrigger action from the guide, it, it, it honestly never felt to me like I was losing control. Of like this, it was you know? taken away. Well, yeah, or, or it was about to kick back on me yeah. or anything weird. Like how, that. Much, how much do you adjust it? Like when you turn that knob? Oh, like in inches? Yeah, or just like two turns or oh, like... Oh, I get you, I get you. There are hash yeah. marks on here. Yeah. So when you're doing this, you can keep track of, I was um, I was four hash marks away from the max. Okay. And I went over two hash marks okay. to do what we just did. So not much. So I'm still I mean, not at the most aggressive yeah, setting. Yeah, yeah. And, and we did take material off a lot faster. Now, in, in the real world, then what I would do is I'd go back to that finer setting. Yeah. And I'd yeah. clean this up some more because now I have some swirl marks in there from being more aggressive. And then one more step, I would put the sanding disc in here yeah. and finish that. Um, one, for the sake of time. And then two, because we're still going to use the sander in a little bit and another step, we're not going to do the sanding step. And additionally, on this, where we're going to do a bunch of hollowing in the middle, mm -hmm. um, we'd want to do some sanding around the rim, but it doesn't pay to sand in here because right. we're cutting all that wood out. Yeah, anyway. yeah. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that... Um, we're talking about this as a power carver for what we're doing here, but you can use it as a conventional angle grinder. In addition to the shrouds we talked about, it does come with a metal shroud, oh. which you could use yeah. um, for normal metal work, and it is variable speed. And one of the things I really like about variable speed and cutting tools is that if you really want to dial in the control and how much material we're taking off, yeah. reducing that RPM, the ability to reduce the RPM is a, is a great way to do yeah. that. All right, so let's do, we're going to have a little bit of a tap dance in here while we do some swapping. Right. And where we're going is, I'm going to take the turbo plane out only so that I can swap shrouds 
because I need the other shroud in here in order to start hollowing. But again, um, if we were looking to sand the surface that we just leveled, we would keep the leveling guide on there, put the sanding pad in there, and then um, hit that same surface with the sanding pad. And then Wayne's asking on the Arbitech, do the attachments come with the milling disc? So, so the turbo plane, this cutter, yep. is sold separately from this device. The shrouds all came with this. Yeah, so you're you're looking at the, it's basically the, the you're buying the motor, the motor and the the dust collection attachments, yeah. and then you can buy the individual attachments separately. Yeah, yeah. And I'm certain that the reason that that evolved is a lot of people own a turbo plane already. Um, mm. Where this is a new tool, the turbo plane itself is not. Oh yeah. So. Um, if you already own a turbo plane, you want this, right? But you don't need to add another yeah. turbo plane to it. And there, it's it's the dust collection aspect of this, which is the which is what they're selling. Is well, it's the dust collection, it's the leveling guy, yeah. it's the variable speed. It's um, there's a lot of stuff going on here that just makes this for this nature of work mm -hmm. um, a very uh, user friendly, easy. Uh, this than this. Mm. Um, uh, ah, okay. Very. Um, Can we show that? Yeah. So one of the so one what, of the things that's here? cool as I stack this stuff up. Yeah. Um, part of our dust collection is coming from the fact that we are connected to a shop vacuum. Part of it is coming from this impeller. Yeah. That I goes that inside cool. here and helps push chips. Um, if you are in a scenario where you're not going to connect to a shop vacuum for some reason. You can put this on as you can having this on is going to help eject stuff mm -hmm. out here. Yeah, that's, I, that's what I teach her. I just saw that in those a yeah, slick great, option. Great question. Yeah, it's a great feature. And, I, and again, it's pretty amazing when we watch you know, yeah. the volume of what right. we just reduce that by um, the small amount of chips that we have on us and the floor. Yeah, no, I mean, I've done a lot of grinding this year, so dust collection would have been nice. <laughs> All right, so now, um, in the big scheme of things, big picture, I'm going to work with this just a little bit. I've already got another bowl set up that's much further along and ready for sanding. So I'll do some of this hollowing just so you get a feel for what that looks like and how it goes. And then we'll switch to that maple so that we have a chance to run the Sanders. Unless I'm having so much fun that I don't want to stop. Then we could be here for a really, really long time. Yeah, I mean, whatever you want to do, George. This is <laughs> The way I'm gonna, my approach here is, it's basically like a bowl, thank you. So I wanna leave a rim kind of around the outside. So I'm gonna work in from there. One of the things that's neat about the turbo plane is that as I start to develop that rim, there are no cutters right on the edge of the turbo plane. So as I start to create a wall, the turbo plane itself can follow that wall as I continue to cut down. It becomes, I, I could have fastened a template to this and then it follow the template, or as I freehand create a wall, it can follow that wall as I continue to cut. Again, it's a it's a distinct feature of the turbo plane that with no cutters on the edge, we can template cut with this. Great way, many, many people use that feature for doing chair seats and creating the scoop in chair seats. Ready? Yep. Thank you.
Second verse, same as the first. We're going to continue this process. And my sequence of events would be, I'd keep hollowing from here. When I have, much like on this walnut bowl, the inside shape that I'm happy with, flip this over, use the turbo plane on the outside mm -hmm. to create this shape, give it that organic look. Um, and then, like we're about to do, switch to the sander, sand the inside, sand the outside. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I liked, I mean, it, it really, it didn't look like you were putting a lot of, like, you weren't putting a lot of effort. Oh, no, I wasn't working hard at No, all. and it's just, I mean, it really, it took a lot off. Like, yeah. you could do, you can do a bullfrog pretty quick. All right, so I'm going to unplug again, and then this will be a simple swap. We'll just go to the sander, and we'll get that piece of maple in here. Yeah. While you're doing that, you want it on that. On the... Yeah. That would be out. wonderful. I forget how this one works. Um, to do unlock. Yep. Yep. And then step on the foot pedal. Yeah. Push the foot pedal as far as you can. Oh, that how you release. I just, I just didn't give it enough. I was too being too gentle on it. Yeah, yeah. And then you gotta, you gotta come in. There you go. Yeah. And let's. You want it in a different spot? I gotta, I gotta think a second. Yeah. This is the side I haven't done yet. So no, you're actually okay. Is that that'll work for you, right? Yeah, give it one more step yep. if you'd be so good. Okay. Nope. Bart so off. on this piece of maple, this is this is a really cool piece. Hard maple, um, same process as I was just using to get to this point. And then on this, what I've done so far is I've sanded this side. I haven't sanded this side. And part of the reason I didn't is there's an amazing curl in this. And what we're looking at right here where we can see that curl so dramatically, that's right off of the turbo plane. That was the last step before I got to where I am now. So again, I've, I've sanded here. I have not sanded here. The finish, the surface we can see here is right off of the turbo plane. So next step I would do now is finish cleaning this up using the sander. So we're right back in our same tool. And again, if we, if we want to have um, really exert some control over this, we could lower the RPM so that we're not going to sand as aggressively um, or leave it at high RPM and sand a little bit more quickly. It just depends on how you want to handle it. What grid are you starting with? Then? This is with a 60 grid in here. Okay. So a little, little aggressive. Pretty aggressive. Grit. Yep. All right, I got to kind of stop myself because I am, uh, I am so enjoying seeing that um, figure pop that I, I could sand just on go for a really long right. Time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, seeing, you know, we were talking about the the wood talks you. You're just kind of working this to see what develops. Yeah, 
and seeing this, oh my gosh, that's so beautiful. And again, th this is... It's like, I mean, it's like a seashell. It's it like that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, you get that exactly. that flow coming in there. Yeah. And we're only at 60 grit yeah. right now. Yeah. So um, clearly the tool, we, <laughs> yeah. the tool is doing what it's supposed to do. And, and I was uh, I was noticing too, the dust collection, even on the sander with 60 grit, like there's not a lot in the air. Yeah. And it's not... It, it did a really good job with that too. I was, I'm, I'm quite surprised that, to be honest. So our, you know, our system here is the tool itself, those shrouds that we talked about. And again, we don't want to, um, we're not backing away from the angle grinder nature of this. There is a metal shroud with it. You could use for conventional mm -hmm. angle grinder work, but, um, with the other two shrouds for power carving, um, one, the dust collection, and then two, man, that, with that leveling disc and the float that it provides to yeah. give you that control so that you're not gouging in and yeah. burning that really expensive slab you just bought. Um, that, that I do find to be a very cool feature that right. makes it, it just makes it very user-friendly, yeah. very approachable. Yeah. That's All right. Cool. Do we have any more, um, do we have any Arbor Tech questions? That's the first. Let's see. I feel like we've covered the Arbor Tech questions. And then, um, all right, so that's, you know, and again, we, we, uh, we walked you through um, features in our demo here on Arbor Tech. Yeah. And then what about, um, just so in wrap up, Do any, have... any cycling back to other um, um, manufacturers, anybody else that? Um, yeah, I feel like we've gotten most of the, the questions coming through that Katie has sent through. Okay. Um, there's a few just like we're talking about some of these yeah, guys, yeah. you know, and I, I feel like we've cut most of those questions. Okay. I mean, yeah. I mean, and you've been good about yeah policing this. Um, yeah. I know. I think, okay. I think we're good on that. Well, how many pieces is that? How many, what is that? This is, I mean, this is. I, I gotta go shopping. <laughs> so not, you so you enjoyed this, and you're 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 gonna be uh, you're gonna be on Amazon soon. Uh, I was actually when I went over to get my soda, I was I, on Amazon earlier. Putting so. stuff in your yeah. cart. Yeah. Well, this was I I hope Prime. that everybody who watched um, enjoyed watching as much as uh, I enjoyed. I hope you enjoyed. Yourself, I did. Yeah. Um, teaching and and taking people through these seven products, a big. Thank you to Woodmaster, Easywood, ShopBot, Tightbon, Castle, Woodpeckers, and ArborTech for participating with us in this um, in this effort to um, bring the show that didn't happen in Atlanta right. to you. And it's uh, uh, it's it, I really enjoy doing these live streams out of my shop and mixing a live stream with being able to tool talk. Is right. pretty darn cool. Yeah. It gives it brings a little normalcy. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. is fun. Yeah. So very good. All right. Matt, thanks so much for coming and hey, joining on. Thanks this. for having me. Um, I thanks appreciate to Katie it. who's behind the scenes. Thanks to Nick who's running the camera. As always, a great job by everybody. And other than that, uh, Katie, you can sign us out.